Thank you very much. It's now my distinct honor and pleasure to ask President Ritesh, who is the president of my host club and the host club for our evening um, from Nairobi, um, to provide the Rotary Grace. President Ritesh. Thank you, Ambassador Dr. Josephine. Uh, good evening, family and friends of Rotary. Let us pray. O oh God and giver of all good, we thank thee for thy divine grace. May Rotary friends and Rotary ways help us serve thee all our days. Amen. Thank you very much, President Ritesh. I now call on Assistant Governor Gugi Muchane to please recite for us the four-way test. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dr. Justin. And good evening, uh, District Governor and fellow Rotarians. The four-way test of the things we think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you very much, A.G. Ngugi Mushane. I'd now like to call on DGN Azeb Azrat to provide the loyal toast. Thank you, Ambassador Dr. Josephine. Good evening, uh, District Governor, the Rotary family, partners, and guests. Let's toast to the President of the Republic of Kenya, President Uhuru Kenyatta. President. To the President. To the President. To the President. To the President. The president. The president. Mr. President. I'll just make a short intervention. A few housekeeping rules. I just want to once again ask that as you enter our meeting, you would register on the chat. Let us know your name and your affiliation by club. Or if you're a guest, let us know whose guest you are kindly. I also just want to let you know that if you have any question or comment, you are free to write it up on the chat and we will endeavor to answer your concern, respond either during the panel discussion or in the breakout session or even later after the official meeting is closed. I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. And now I'd like to turn over to the official meeting. We want to run on time. So I ask that you would attend very carefully to our proceedings. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce District Governor Patrick Obath. I would like to let you know that Patrick Obath is a member of the Rotary Club of Muthaiga. He joined Rotary in 1993 in Malaysia. But before joining, well, after Malaysia, he then joined the Rotary Club of Mombasa North Coast. He served as president of the Rotary Club of Mombasa North Coast for four years. And he has also held other senior Rotary leadership positions. I'd like to let you know that DG Obath is a mechanical engineer by training, trained at the University of Nottingham, England. He has vast experience in the oil and gas industry. He has served as country chair of Kenya Shell. Patrick has also run a private practice in energy and the extractive sector. He serves on the boards of several organizations in oil and gas, in personal healthcare, finance services, IT services, 
and even agroforestry. He served as a chairman of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance and the Federation of Kenya Employers. He's a member of Aspen's Global Leadership Network and a fellow of the Africa Leadership Initiative. He was awarded the Order of the Grand Warrior in 2008 and the National Peace Prize in 2011, the Order of the Moran of the Burning Spear in 2011 by the President of Kenya. He's a much sought upon, looked for speaker in governance, leadership and sustainability issues. He plays the guitar and he plays lots of African instruments. He's an avid handicap golfer. He served as chair of the National Amateur Golf Association. Patrick is married to Rotarian Terry Oba. He's father to Brenda, Cindy, Lindsay, and grandfather. Welcome, DG Obath. Thank you very much for hosting this webinar. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Josephine, and uh, thank you everybody who's been involved in the organization of this particular event today. Um, and it is indeed my pleasure to welcome all of you to this event. And um, mine will be some very brief remarks, and then I hope I can hand over to uh, to, uh, to uh, Rosie Trustee um, Gita Manik to say a few words. So let, let me start on my presentation um, and then hand over to, to Trustee Gita. So Vice President Roche International, Your Excellencies, Representatives of the World Health Organization, UNICEF and Roche International, distinguished governors, past district governors, presidents and past presidents, Rotarians, Rotaractors, Families and friends of Rotary, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And good day to you for, from wherever you are. And thank you for joining this webinar. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the District 9212 webinar, where we are doing a celebration of Rotary and a polio-free Africa. Two months ago, the international community marked the end of the wild polio virus in Africa. This historic event is the central reason for our celebration today. As Rotary International, it is also the reason why we chose to celebrate with our partners. None of us could have done it alone. It is wonderful to have our Vice President, Jorita Solari, at this celebration with us. Jorita is joining us all the way from California at 6 a.m. in the morning in the cold of a winter setting. Thank you very much for joining. Since 1966, governments and nonprofits have worked to eradic eradicate the world polio virus from the African continent with sustained vaccination campaigns. Almost 9 billion polio vaccines have been delivered. Several tens of thousands of community mobilizers, health workers have dedicated their time and efforts to ensuring that every last child was immunized. Rotary clubs, in partnership with partners, have campaigned and advocated for the end of polio. This includes um, some of the di districts 9212. And there have been many occasions when a lot of us have traveled long distances with health workers in the back of our cars, some of us packing our families, going out to ensure that we are able to reach um, a lot of the places where polio was, was, uh, was, was rampant and being able to actually um, immunize children in those areas. And for all those of you who took part in all these excursions, all these interventions together with the governments over the last 20, 30 years, I wish to thank you all for the efforts that you really put in. And some of you Rotarians present on this have been on this journey since the whole polio campaign started. A large part of the eradication effort has been through the Global Polio Eradication In Initiative, which was created in 1988 and is led by the national governments and five partners, Rotary International, the World Health Organizations, UNICEF, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, commonly called CDC, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In the spirit of partnership, I therefore welcome heartily to this webinar, Dr. Michael Zafron of World Health Organization from Geneva, Ms. Maniza Zaman of UNICEF Kenya, and Ms. Judith Dement, the RI coordinator of all national polio committees. These are true partners in our celebrations. I also welcome Aziz Memon, who leads the National Polio Committee in Pakistan, where global attention is now focused. I'm a well-celebrated brother 
Dr. Tunji Funcho, whose leadership for the polio eradication effort in Nigeria brought us great jubilation as we marked the end of polio in Africa. I know um, Aziz is going to have to leave us fairly quickly, so let me um, try and speed up on my presentation so that Aziz, I know you can then uh, be able to leave us as, um, and then continue with your next event. Thank you very much, DG. We will now ask uh, Trustee Gita Manik to deliver some remarks. Do we have Trustee Gita Manik present? Um, Josephine, she may not be quite in because we are about a couple of minutes ahead of the program. And she may have been she's, she's just joined. Yeah. I've just admitted her. All right. Did you get her? PDG Samanik, we are looking to hear from you. Hi, how are you? We are fine. We are braced and ready to hear you. Me? Kindly do join us in the conversation and introduce our keynote speaker for us. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, before I do that, uh, Ambassador Josephine, I have a message on my phone from uh, PDG Aziz Memon. Uh, he wants to give a few brief remarks and leave. <clears throat> so you tell me what to do. I'm happy to do whatever you tell me. All right. Um, I would want to ask our Vice President if the Vice President will allow us to break with protocol. Vice President Johitra Solari is on the program next. And um, we are hoping that she will speak to us and then we will ask Mr. Aziz Memon to be the first panelist. Okay. So uh, shall I go ahead? Uh, Gita, actually, you know, uh, I will not be able to join the panel. I have sent an email also, there was a confusion in time. So I, if it is all right, um, it's an informal get together for celebrating Nigeria and making the world polio free. So I can give you remarks. If, otherwise, I have shared my video also with the ambassador. They can play that also. And I'll join later on once I get off the other Zoom call. If it is all right, I can give remarks. Otherwise, I can leave without him. Thank you very much. Gita, I will therefore turn with uh, deference to Mr. Aziz Memon and uh, allow him to give his uh, three minute address on polio. Yeah. Yeah, I was, two two Judith, and a half minutes. Yes, I, I do minutes. hope that Judith Diamond will not mind introducing you so that we have uh, the introduction that she has so carefully prepared. Okay, okay, please, please, Judith yes. is my friend. Yes, um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure and privilege to introduce trustee Aziz Memon. Um, Aziz is chair of the National Polio Plus Committee in Pakistan and has worked tirelessly for decades on the polio program in Pakistan and has also been a wise um, guide and counselor for the program in the rest of the world. And it's been a great pleasure working with him for many, many years. And it's a great pleasure tonight to introduce him to give us his remarks for this important meeting. Thank you, Aziz. Thank you. Thank you, my friend, Judith. Uh, Rotary is all about partnership. It was 41 years back, we started our journey for a polio free world. At that time, we were all alone. Subsequently, 
when WHO and UNICEF and CDC joined us, this became the global partnership for eradication. Later on, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation also joined us and many government joined us. For Rotary, it has been a long journey. When we started the battle, we used to have 250,000 cases a year and we had 75 endemic countries. From there, we have come to a point that after Nigeria being declared wild polio free, only two countries are left, which is Pakistan and Afghanistan. The work goes on and we hope that we are able to keep the promise Rotary made to the children of the world that no child will suffer from this crippling disease. For Pakistan, which is my own country, you know, in the year 2019, on 22nd of April, due to a fake campaign by a uh, political party, which is in opposition to the ruling party, the total campaign was derailed. It was for the first time that NIDs were halted and the news spread that 50 children have died because of OPV. Not a single child died, but 300,000 children were admitted in hospitals in two hours in Peshawar. It took us some time, six months, seven months, to regain the focus and then restart the campaign. In the year 2020, when we, January, February, March, we started the campaigns with more trust, with more confidence to move forward. COVID-19 came our way. Six months were lost. It was just not a setback to polio program. As a matter of fact, 80 million children who were deprived of vaccination were the target of measles, meningitis, and of course, polio. In July, we were able to start a small uh, response to the derived cases. Now, the derived cases, the white polio cases number that today uh, around 114, 54 in Afghanistan and 74 in Pakistan. But the derived cases have crossed 400. So our first July response was for derived cases and wild polio case response. In August, we built up the campaign to take it to a little larger. And it was only in September this month that we were able to resume the full NIDs in Pakistan and Afghanistan and in Pakistan targeting 40 million children. We have very positive news of the September coverage and with the help of Pakistan Army, it was for the first time that we were able to cover the children house to house in South Waziristan, which is in the mountains and the troubled area. Unfortunately, we lost another vaccinator on the 25th of September. She was killed, Nahid Gul, 25 years old. We have lost almost 218 so far. It is sad that when we are doing a noble cause, we lose our volunteers. Now, we are planning to have full-fledged NIDs in October, November, and December. November, December NIDs are going to use, as per the tag recommendation, trivalent. Now, trivalent was discarded, but it has been made especially for Pakistan and Afghanistan for the reason that it is going to attack both. It is going to attack the um, uh, wild polio, at the same time, it is going to attack the uh, derived cases. Now, for derived cases, the NOVA vaccine or NPV2, which is a new research, is almost ready to be rolled out. 
we will be among the first countries to use it. And what is Nova vaccine going to do? Nova vaccine is going to halt the spread of derived cases, which is very rampant in Africa. It is there in Philippines. It is there in Thailand, Myanmar. And we have cases in the north of Pakistan. Uh, it is restricted to that area, but we need to target that. So we have full confidence in the partner's ability, in the support of the government, in the support of the army. We need the support fully. In Afghanistan, that's a different story. We have, you know, uh, trouble in reaching the children. The law and order is not that uh, cohesive but we will get over that also. So um, uh, I can tell you that we are fully committed. We are fully uh, energized to make sure that we march forward and we are able to stop transmission in this region of Mediterranean also in the year 2021. I would Try and I'm on another Zoom. Sorry for the mix up of timing, but I will try and join uh, for the uh, uh, debate or anything what you have later on. Uh, my apologies to the vice, pres vice president, who is my personal friend, and my highest regard to her and to my co trustee, uh, Gita. And of course, Tunji is our friend, Judith, we love her. So, um, an ambassador, thank you very much. My highest regards to your district governor and to the president. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Aziz Memon. I'm going to hand back to Judith and ask Judith to continue with the panelists because we still await um, the entry into the meeting of our Vice President. So Judith, perhaps you continue and introduce for us yes. Dr. Safran, please. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador Ojambo. Um, distinguished guests, District Governor, Rotarians, good evening. And thank you for the invitation to join you today. It really is a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm from the Maidenhead Ro Thames Rotary Club in the United Kingdom. I'm a member of the International Polio Plus Committee and I'm Dean of the Rotary Representative Network. And I've worked for more than 20 years and been involved with the Polio Eradication Program. And of course, today we are here to celebrate Africa being declared certified polio free and also to mark World Polio Day next weekend so that we continue our support and determination to get the job done. As um, Aziz mentioned, Rotary started the polio eradication program in 1985. In 1988, the World Health Assembly took it on and we formed the Global Polio Eradication Initiative with our partners of UNICEF, WHO, CDC, and the Gates Foundation, and most recently, the Global Alliance for Vaccines. And Rotary's role in this partnership is threefold. Fundraising, and as you know, we have the $50 million um, fundraising commitment um, each year until 2023, volunteering on the ground, and of course the model of examples of those are our panelists tonight, um, Aziz Menon and um, Tunji Funjo, and um, also advocacy to governments. And I'm going to um, just take a few minutes to um, explain the advocacy role that Rotary has and why, why we need it. Um, so if I could have my slide presentation, please, and have the first slide. Thank you. So this slide, um, can you bring it up so it fills the whole screen? Um, this, show, this is a map of the world showing the COVID-19 pandemic today. And Aziz has already mentioned the impact that it's had on the program. And I know that Michelle 
and we'll be talking a bit more about this later. But I just wanted to show this because if you looked at the map in 1985 when Rotary started the programme for polio, it would have been a similar situation with polio outbreaks in 125 countries um, and 350,000 cases a day. And so we've entered 2020 knowing that we had challenges to address and overcome to stop the transmission of polio in the endemic countries and sustain and build on the progress in other areas. The COVID-19 pandemic has been an unanticipated challenge in 2020, a curveball that nobody could have anticipated. And it's creating huge problems all around the world. And as I said, this map shows countries that are affected. And um, it's reminiscent really of the early days of the fight against polio, a virus that has impacted life throughout the world and which like polio was not well understood and initially lacked a preventative vaccine or ineffective cure. And therefore placing an extraordinary public health threat to communities and a burden on health systems. And so on this slide, you can see the programmatic impact of COVID-19 on our um, polio eradication activities. Overall, since late February, early March, more than 60 polio vaccination campaigns have been paused in 38 countries. Six million doses of vaccine have been delivered to those countries, but they couldn't be used. Another 100 million doses were cured, but still await shipment because of air freight disruption. Some of these vaccines have been delivered in the weeks running up to the vaccination campaigns that were resumed in July 2020, as Aziz just mentioned. However, other batches of vaccines will be nearing the end of their shelf life and the polio program will have to bear the costs of the waste and resupply. And some of the suppliers are reaching storage capacity and may well be forced to stop production. And there may be longer term implications for manufacturers. So the COVID-19 context for the polio programs in Pakistan, Afghanistan and Nigeria, um, it will be discussed in, in the coming presentations. Polio surveillance has been continuing, but there's been a widespread and substantial impact on it, including um, a decrease in case detection in the Western Pacific, the Southeast Asia and the Eastern Mediterranean regions. We've had a reduction of environmental surveillance in several countries of Southeast Asia and the Eastern Mediterranean regions. And there's been significant disruption in the transport of polio related laboratory specimens in the Africa region. Next slide, please. So of course, this all has terrific, could you go back to the previous slide, the financial implications? This all has a major impact on the finances of the polio program. The cost of conducting activities is now higher um, due to the addition of having to fund um, personal protection equipment. The programmatic pause means that the GPI is facing a larger budget, budget than origi originally anticipated in 2021. And even with the existing donor pledges and commitments, including Rotary's um, commitment of, the, as I mentioned, the $50 million a year, the initiative is facing a funding gap in 2021 of up to $470 million. In addition to our own fundraising efforts, Rotary and partners are continuing to work with governments and multilateral institutions to meet these urgent, need, urgent funding needs so that we can continue our progress towards eradication. The next slide, please. In its recent report, the Independent Monitoring Board highlighted um, the contribution made by the GPI towards the pandemic response. The handling of the COVID-19 pandemic in many polio affected countries and subnational jurisdictions has brought a great deal of pay praise for the polio program. It should be rightly commended for how quickly it was able to pivot staff to respond to COVID-19. And it shows how investments in polio can be used in a much broader way for global health security. Next slide, please. So this is how polio workers are fighting COVID-19. Um, they're coordinating outbreak responses, educating communities on prevention, investigating cases, training health workers, tracing contracts. Um, the Polio Plus infrastructure has made up the backbone of the GPEI fighting COVID-19. 
Frontline health workers are teaching communities how to keep safe from COVID. Surveillance medical officers are investigating cases of polio and COVID and provide training for frontline healthcare workers. And just as they do for polio, when a person tests positive for COVID, their close contacts are also tested to determine if the virus is spreading. And this is a demonstrable example of the plus in Polio Plus. The next slide, please. So the bottom line, our work is more important than ever. While the GPEI faces significant challenges to sustaining and expanding progress, we can and must continue our efforts. As we have seen with other diseases, including measles, yellow fever and Ebola, polio eradication infrastructure continues to contribute to the broader global health efforts. A win for polio is a win for global health. The GPEI has repeatedly adapted and innovated to address and overcome obstacles. We are resilient and with continued resolve, we can achieve our goal of a polio free world. Every dollar we raise, every letter we write to a member of Congress, and every time we share information with our friend and family about our efforts, we get closer to eradication. Thank you all um, for all that you continue to do to ensure that we will end polio now and forever. Thank you very much. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Zafran. Michelle has been the Director of Polio Eradication at the World Health Organization to, since 2016. And in fact, just yesterday, we had the uh, meeting of the International Polio Plus Committee, um, which sadly will be um, Michelle's last meeting because he is due to retire in the next couple of months. And I'd like to take this opportunity of, of thanking Michel for the tremendous contribution that he's made to the polio program and um, to welcome him to this meeting to give us an update on the program. So Michel, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. And um, hello, everyone. And um, I'm uh, delighted to be with you and very honored to have been invited to uh, give a short presentation to uh, this audience. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm the one, uh, so can, can I have the slides, please? Next slide, please. So I'll give you an update on the program at the global level. Next. The, as, as everybody knows, when the World Health Assembly um, resolved to eradicate polio, the wild polio virus was endemic in 125 countries in the world, and a thousand children were being paralyzed uh, every day. Next slide. Today, only two countries are countries where the wild polio virus remains endemic, and that's Pakistan and Afghanistan, as we've heard from Aziz Memon. Um, we have a few hundred cases, uh, and that's too many, of course. Um, next slide, please. But of course, as you all know, we've made a very big success uh, this year by certifying the African region free of wild polyvars. And this is a copy of the certificate. It is indeed a great achievement, because when in 2016, after two years without detecting any polyvars in polio case, we actually had an outbreak in northeastern Nigeria. We were extremely worried that this pocket of wild polio virus that was still circulating could actually spread to other countries in Africa and, of course, beyond African region. Now, the program, and no, back please. The program was actually sort of uh, extremely strongly uh, motivated to avoid uh, that catastrophe. And thanks to Rotarian, um, such as uh, uh, Tunji and to the uh, Nigeria program were able to maintain and to contain the virus within the Nigerian borders so it did not spread and and we now are able to reach this uh, sort of extraordinary achievement of certifying the, the African region free of wild polio virus. Next slide please. But this is the picture that we have today. As you see, we have quite a lot of wild polyovirus still cases in Pakistan and Afghanistan. These are the red dots. But we also have several outbreaks, and many of them in Africa, but also in Pakistan and Afghanistan, 
outbreaks of what we call the circulating vaccine-derived uh, poliovirus. Next slide, please. And why do these outbreaks occur? They continue to occur because we have a low immunity to the virus, uh, the poliovirus type 2. Uh, we are, have declining immunity among children that were born after April 2016, when the world removed or oral polio vaccine type 2 from the vaccine that we're using in the routine immunization program. Uh, so the immunity of the population since then has waned tremendously. The outbreak response um, has also sort of probably not been at the level of quality that we need to actually ensure that all children are vaccinated. And when we use the monovalent oral polio vaccine type 2 at the moment to actually respond to the outbreaks, what happens is that while it stops the outbreak that we're fighting, uh, gradually it sort of, uh, sort of uh, feeds into new outbreaks outside of the area where we have vaccinated. Because children in those areas, neighboring the areas where we vaccinated, do not have immunity against type 2. Next slide. So what are we doing about that? We have a very sort of elaborated strategy. Uh, first, of, first of all, we need to optimize the response to the outbreaks and, and ensuring that all children really get vaccinated with a monovalent or polio vaccine type 2. But as Aziz um, Memon um, reported earlier in his, in his uh, uh, intervention, we also are developing what we call the novel oral polio vaccine type 2. It's a new vaccine that will help us address those outbreaks. It is uh, genetically modified to have a much better stability and will decrease tremendously the risk of uh, vaccine-derived polioviruses. WHO will issue recommendations for what we call an emergency use listing so that the vaccine can actually be rolled out and used by the countries that ask for it before it is uh, actually fully licensed. Um, and uh, we hope to have this emergency use listing, which is a, a recommendation for initial use as early as um, you know, next week or the week after. So the production has already started so that when the emergency use listing is granted and countries ask for this vaccine, we can actually start rolling it out without limitation to the countries that uh, need the vaccine. Next slide, please. And that will be, of course, a very important intervention. As uh, Judith mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge amount of impact on the program. Max mass vaccination campaigns have been supposed for at least three months, um, and, but not only against polio, also against measles and other vaccines, vaccine uh, preventable diseases. We have at least 80 million children under one who are at risk of those diseases. We have repurposed the infrastructure of the polio program to support countries' response to COVID-19. And some of the supplemental activities um, that, that we had planned and that were posed are now resuming, but they're resuming with new operational safety measures for health workers and also for the communities they serve. Next slide. Next, please. No, go back one. So the staff, as Judith had mentioned, um, have supported in various ways the response to COVID-19. They've resp uh, resp they, they supported in outbreak response. They've helped the country program sort of preparedness and, and, and establish coordination mechanism. They're doing surveillance. They're sort of tracing the contacts of the cases. They also work a lot on communication to ensure that some of the rumors that spreads and are detrimental to the response are actually faults. Um, they help with the data management and reporting, and they also help train the health workers on sort of good um, infection prevention and control measures so that they actually can serve the communities without sort of risk to themselves as well as risk to the community. Next slide, please. At the end of May, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative issued new recommendations so that we can um, actually assess the situation and resume the activities. The problem is that we've done a modeling of uh, what would happen in countries that have vaccine-derived outbreaks or uh, wild virus, 
uh, in the absence of those campaigns that we are conducting at a regular basis. And this modeling has shown that there was go going to be an exponential increase in the number of cases. So we are recommending to the countries that they resume activities, but they need to do that on the basis of a risk analysis. And uh, sure that we don't, um, we don't let the virus uh, spread further. Uh, we've issued operation guidance for the countries to ensure that they actually have good uh, training of their health workers before they launch into these campaigns. And the, 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 um, the, the countries have already scheduled those, those campaigns. Some of them have already taken place. Next, please. So in this context, we are faced with, first of all, only one remaining region, that's the Eastern Mediterranean region, with well polyvirus continues to circulate, and only two countries. So we absolutely need to sort of end once and for all with the well polyvirus. And at the same time, of course, we'll need to sort of ensure that the novel oral polio vaccine is rolled out in such a way that we can stop those outbreaks of vaccine-derived polyviruses. So next slide. This, this is the last kid. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is the last kid that was paralyzed in the Americas and that happened in 1991, already 20 years ago, 19 years ago. Luis Fermin Tenoria. Next slide. In the Western Pacific, the last kid to have been paralyzed was in Cambodia, that was Mom Chanti. Next. In the European region, Melik Minhas was uh, the last kid to be paralyzed in Turkey in 1998. Next. And in the Southeast Asia, in India, uh, the little Ruksha Khatun was the little girl who was last paralyzed by polio. Next. And thankfully, Yafana Ali is the last uh, little girl who actually got paralyzed in Nigeria, in African region, by the wild polio virus. So let's continue to work all together to actually eradicate polio. Thank you very much. Thank you to Rotary for the great work and the leadership that you're showing in this extraordinary effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michel. It's now my privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Tunji Funjo, um, who, like Aziz, has worked tirelessly for polio eradication in Nigeria. And he has, uh, he chairs the National Polio Press Committee there, and he has just been recognized for the work that his contribution to um, polio eradication in Nigeria and subsequently the certification of Africa being polio free. He's been recognized by Time magazine as being one of of the 100 most influential people in the world. And I have to say, this is very richly deserved. And it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Tunji Funjo to speak to us tonight. Thank you, Tunji. Josephine, is Tunji? Oh, yes, there he is. Good. You need to unmute it. That's I've it. just <laughs> managed to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great opportunity uh, for us to share experiences. And I'm, I'm delighted that uh, we've had a very good briefing from uh, Michelle Zafran, uh, the polio leader at WHO. Um, the first image is, is, is the summary of my presentation uh, because all our efforts in the past, all our efforts now, and all our efforts in the future, when we say what next, ends up here, which is ensuring that those precious drops of the oral polio vaccines get to the child. Whatever we're doing, whether in advocacy or creating awareness or fundraising, the final objective is to end up here, getting the child immunized against the wild polio virus and preventing polio paralysis or some, in some rare instances, death. And how has the journey been? It's been tough and rough and sometimes frustrating, 
Next slide. But we did it. Rotary did it. We, we finally have certification for Nigeria and by extension, the whole of Africa um, on the 25th of August by an independent body uh, that reports to WHO. So it's a great milestone. It's time for us to rejoice. It's to pat ourselves on the back for a job well done. And the credit for this goes to all Rotarians around the world, particularly those parts of the world that have been polio free for decades. Like the United Kingdom, for instance, who continue to support this program, particularly in the area of funding and advocacy in other areas. So congratulations to all of us. But as you asked me to talk about what next, before I get to what next, let me talk next about how we managed to get here. What, was the, what were the instruments? What were the motivating factors that got us here? And I think the singular honor for this must go to Rotary Partnership with President Mandela, Mandela, Nelson Mandela of Blessed Memory. It was the Rotary leadership in 1996, you know, that made an overture to President Mandela because of his stand, his image, his respectability in Africa, to get African leaders to wake up from their slumber and as much as possible, ensure that mass immunization campaigns begin because that was the only way at that time to bridge the huge gap of suboptimally immune children. So it ended up being the task of the president of Rotary International in my year, 1995-96 at Brown, and subsequently President Louis Guy and Rotary Foundation trustee chair Raja Sabu to get the kick, up, kick polio out of Africa campaign going. And you can see as Judith has shown, and uh, particularly Michelle's slide, next slide, I wouldn't dwell too much on this, next slide. We have been able by that singular, back one slide, by that singular effort to galvanize African leaders that led to the Kick, Ac Kick Polio Out of Africa initiative, we reduced our polio cases from 70,000 per year in Africa representing more than 50% of cases to less than 5,000 cases within two years. Because within a year, 30 African countries started mass immunization campaigns. And this is what has got us to this milestone, that now we have just two countries. But then it's our work done. Next slide. I will skip this slide because it's just talking about our local uh, evol you know, evolution from high cases of polio to zero cases in the last four years. But then what has been our challenges? We are all familiar with the anti-polio vaccine campaign. My colleague and trustee um, Aziz Memon has touched on that and how it has negatively impacted this program in Pakistan. It has been the same in Nigeria. There's also the issue of low routine immunization coverage which is relatively, can you hear me? Which is, yes. due, which is due mostly to our uh, very um, decaying structure of primary healthcare, where most routine immunization takes place. We then had in recent times added to that, our challenge with vaccine derived you know, polio cases. And in Nigeria, and of course, to a large extent in Afghanistan and Pakistan, we had the issue of insurgency that made immunization campaigns difficult. Funding had moved from where we started with a budget of 120 million US dollars to a point where we have spent so far almost 20 billion US dollars. 2.1 billion of those being provided by Roche International. This includes the Gates match. And of course, Judith had talked about COVID-19 and what it has done to the program in terms of challenges. I'll just talk about funding a little bit um, in terms of next slide, in terms of how 
it has been negatively impacted and why our budget keeps ballooning. Next slide. One is we need debt funds uh, to attend to previously unexpected vaccine-derived outbreaks. The second, as I've mentioned, is COVID-19, and also the setbacks in Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, Aziz had mentioned that. But then, now that we have been certified polio-free, there is increased political and economic constraints at country and donor levels. It is going to be much more difficult now to convince governments to appropriate adequate amount of funds for us to carry out the tasks that are still ahead of us. That is ensuring that children continue uh, to be routinely immunized and mass immunization campaigns take place. I'll talk about that a little bit in more detail uh, shortly. Next slide, because people will ask you, why do we still need all this amount of money? It's a pie chart showing where most of our funds go. They go essentially to areas that will still need to be participating in Africa. And that is surveillance and mass immunization campaign. Despite the fact that you've been polio for quite some time, there are still national immunization days going on that need to be funded. Of course, with campaigns, you have to make sure that you have a robust surveillance system. And this takes almost 60% of our funding. So Rotarians will ask, funders will ask, why do you still need this money? This is why, because we need to continue uh, expenditure in these areas that have been shown on this pie chart. Next slide. So as far as fundraising is concerned, we need to remember our Gates March, that Rotary needs to raise 50 million US dollars every year and spend it on polio eradication efforts. And then the Gates Foundation will match it by 100 million US dollars. We have this commitment till 2023, and we hope that all of us will do our bit to ensure that we contribute to this fund. Currently, clause have been asked to donate a minimum of $1,500. But more importantly, we need to advocate for all Rotarians to contribute to these funds, no matter how little. Little drops make an ocean. So next slide, have you donated to the Polio Plus Fund? If you haven't, after this conference, you can donate as little as 20 US dollars. It's so easy to do. Just go online, rotary.org, flash, donate, or mpolio now slash donate. It's so easy. I can guarantee you in two minutes, you'll be able to get your funds to the Rotary Foundation and it will be promptly acknowledged. We need to be out there, let's lead by example, by supporting immunization activities at the grassroots level. And of course, we need to continue creating awareness by promoting polio education through the print, electronic, and social media. So what must we continue to do? Next slide. Advocacy. Judith had mentioned some aspects of advocacy, but we need to also continue advocating to Rotarians because, as you know, our membership is very fluid. Some come and others leave. So we need to continue maintaining the education of our Rotarians to buy into this program. Of course, the most important people we need to advocate to are the government for resources and our communities to embrace immunization and demand to be immunized. Social mobilization is very important. Increase in routine immunization is very important. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to be able to raise more funds and we need to arm ourselves with sufficient information to convince Rotarians and other donors of the need for us to continue raising funds for our efforts. Because at the end of the day, like I started with, our aim will continue to be getting those precious drops of the oral polio virus to our children. Because as long as there's one case of the wild polio virus in the world, no child is safe. Countries that have escaped the, the ravages of polio for decades, 
still immunize their children regularly. The only way we can protect and continue to protect our children is to ensure that they get the oral polio virus, oral polio vaccine. So finally, is to keep in focus that, yes, we want to end polio in the rest of the world. Next slide. Right now, in Africa, we need to keep polio at zero. Remember that we still have the COVID pandemic on. So we need to keep safe, wear masks. When we're going out in public, if we don't have to go out, we to stay at home, wash our hands, and ensure that if we can't, we use sanitizers. So what next is to continue doing what we have been doing. It is going to be a little bit more difficult in Africa because we've been certified polio free, but our job is not done until no child in the world is at risk of contracting the Y polio virus and getting paralyzed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Twinjing Funsho, for that very, I would say, poignant address. You have stirred up our commitment, not only to personal contribution, but also what we can do as a community of Rotarians, Rotaractors, and friends. Um, DG, distinguished guests, Rotarians, Rotaractors, and friends, I'd like to just acknowledge the presence of our Vice President amongst us, but uh, shortly we shall actually introduce her. I want us to continue to hear from one of our expert panelists. But before I introduce this expert panelist, I want to just say a word about Judith Diamond, who has so ably introduced us to the technical part of the discussion tonight. I've known Judith Diamond now for almost five years. I need to let you know she is a dedicated Rotarian. Judith is on the Queen's Honours list for the extraordinary range of charity work that she does. I need to let you know Judith is a geologist by training. She's been a club president. She has been a district governor. She has served as a United Kingdom's national advisor on Rotary International polio work. And during that time, the British government made a startling announcement of a contribution of 400 million pounds to polio eradication. As she's told you, Judith is now the Dean of the Rotary International Representative Network. I am a member of that network and honored with Judy's leadership and stewardship. She is also the coordinator of all national polio committees under Rotary International. Thank you very much, Judith, for introducing our discussions and for bringing to us the rich panelists that have addressed us. I'd like to now move to our last expert panelist, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Maniza Zaman. Maniza is the representative of UNICEF Kenya Country Office. This is Maniza's second tour in Kenya. She served earlier in Kenya as chief of nutrition in the health section. Prior to this, she was UNICEF's representative in the United Republic of Tanzania. Maniza is a safe pair of hands when it comes to UNICEF. She served in New York as deputy director in the program division. At that time, I had the pleasure of working with Maniza in New York. Ms. Zaman is a dual national of Bangladesh and of the United Kingdom. She's married and she has two children. UNICEF and Rotary will soon formalize a collaborative agreement and I'm sure she'll speak to us about it. Maniza, you have the floor. Please address us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, distinguished participants, esteemed speakers, ladies and gentlemen, the Rotary family, um, it, it's really a great pleasure to join you today and, and a very um, warm good evening from myself. I have to say, Ambassador Josephine, this is a, quite a humbling experience given that a lot of the greats of the polio eradication movement are here on this panel, and I certainly don't consider myself one of them at all. But I do, but I do belong to the UNICEF family, who has been a partner in, in this journey. So perhaps in that in, in, in that way, I, I feel I can join this uh, this group. Um, 
so before we speak, I uh, speak specifically to what we're looking at in terms of, you know, sort of Kenya and, and Rotary here, um, allow me to just make a few reflections. Of course, we all know that this, we are in this uh, once in a century pandemic and trying hard to slow down the spread of COVID-19, a virus that has killed more than 1 million people worldwide. And here, I think we do need to congratulate and appreciate the efforts that the government of Kenya have made um, to manage um, and manage COVID-19 and also mitigate the impact on, on lives and livelihoods. So as scientists around the world seek to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, I think it's helpful to learn from history and remind ourselves how we confronted the age-old enemy of polio. During the first half of the 20th century, scenes of hospital wards filled with children in iron lungs terrified parents across the globe. Back then, every year, people braced for summer polio outbreaks as public gathering places closed their doors and children were socially distanced from each other. And then in 1955, a vaccine was discovered, which then has been universally used since. So the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention estimates that since 1988, the polio vaccine has prevented more than 10 million cases of paralysis and saved the lives of approximately 500,000 people. So ladies and gentlemen, since the challenging times of the last century, the world has made incredible strides against polio, as has been mentioned by many of the speakers before me. We've reduced wild polio cases by over 99%, and we do have the last frontiers to still conquer, which we will in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it is a remarkable achievement, as you've all mentioned before, realized to a large extent thanks to the work done by the Global Polio Eradication Initiative and really spearheaded in the early years by Rotary. So thank you. And together in this initiative, which includes UNICEF, Rotary, WHO, CDC, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Gavi, we've managed to immunize more than 450 million children against polio each year. And these are not just numbers, they represent children, who otherwise would risk paralysis, be unable to walk, their lives diminished and their futures bleak. So dear Rot Rotarians, as we mark World Polio Day 2020, we can take comfort in the fact that here in Kenya, the last case of indigenous wild polio virus was recorded in 1984. And in Kenya, Rotary has supported UNICEF for over 15 years it's provided funding through UNICEF for several polio vaccination campaigns. This has contributed to the vaccination of more than 8 million children under five per year between 2013 and 2019 with multiple doses of oral polio vaccine. Rotary support has enabled Kenya to maintain a polio free status despite incidences of polio outbreak when the virus has been imported from neighboring countries. And as UNICEF, we are grateful to Rotary for funding our polio vaccine procurement, as well as supporting the behavior change activities that raise awareness on the importance of vaccination and mobilize communities to demand polio and also other vaccines. Uh, some, one of the earlier speakers also talked about advocacy and Rotary has also partnered with UNICEF here on, on advocacy with government, communities, and the private sector in support of polio eradication. And members of Rotary Kenya have made in-kind contributions that have supported vaccination teams during polio campaigns. So thank you all. But as was mentioned by the previous speaker, we cannot let our guard down and we have to keep the surveillance strong and keep polio at zero in Africa. So dear Rotarians and distinguished guests, I think the world can only overcome the last hurdles to reach the full eradication of polio if the effort to reach and vaccinate children receives resources, commitments, and action from governments, donors, multilateral organizations, civil society organizations, and local communities. So a true partnership. And the same applies, I think, to COVID-19, which now has taken a toll on both health and livelihoods. 
And in this context, I'm delighted that we will soon begin a new chapter in UNICEF's cooperation with Rotary in Kenya. Our initial focus will be to work together to support children to return safely to schools with water, sanitation and hygiene facilities for up to 400 rural schools. Children in Kenya have been away from schools for over six months and there has been some resumption of learning in the last week. And this is beyond the loss of actually learning for so many. There are many, many other consequences of staying at home for so long. So we're really keen to partner together to make sure that there is a safe return to school. This will be done together with the Ministry of Education and we will focus on the counties and schools where the, great is the, need, where the need is the greatest. There will also be a component on menstrual hygiene management in this work. And the second phase of the partnership, we plan to work on behavior change communication, which will focus both on issues related to COVID-19 and also another key issue here in Kenya, which is ending violence against children. So in closing, Rotary, UNICEF, and others working together, we do believe we can finally put polio where it belongs, in the pages of the history books. And we can tackle COVID effectively. And in all, doing all this together, we can make a real difference in children's lives, especially those who are most in need. So as they say here in Kenya, thank you for listening. Asanteni sana. Thank you very much, Manisa. At this point in the program, I am going to turn over to DG Patrick Obad so that he will pick up where we left off and bring on Gita, who will bring on our Vice President. DG, over to you. Thank you very much, Josephine. And um, when I finished um, my past president, past district governor and everything else, um, Gita Manek hadn't joined the call because you're running a little bit early. But now we are sort of just um, um, catching up on time. And my pleasure is to briefly introduce um, uh, Trustee Gita so that she can then make her remarks and invite our, our, our key keynote speaker today. Um, Gita is, uh, Trustee Gita is a person that I've known since I um, became active in Rotary in Nairobi. She joined Rotary in 1997 and, the, and she's still in the same Rotary club with Mudaiga that she joined at that time. And she has um, risen in the ranks and became the, the ranks. first, became the first uh, female district governor of Rotary District 9200 in 2013-2014, and then also midwife the split of the district at that point in time into District 9211 and 9212, where we are now. And um, she's then taken on some senior um, positions within the Rotary international scene. Um, until now, when she's now the trustee in the Rotary Foundation. Personally, Gita is also a major donor. She's a benefactor and a member of the Ash Club uh, Society. Gita is very, very well entrenched in giving and in the, in, in the, in, in the foundation. So fellow Rotarians, honored guests, I give you trustee Gita Manek. Gita? Thank you. Thank you, District Governor Patrick. Patrick forgot to mention that we both belong to the hottest club on the continent of Africa, which is the Rotary Club of Utaiga. We both belong to the same club. Thank you, Governor, for that very generous introduction. District Governor Patrick Obath, friends and family of Rotary, I am so delighted to be with you all today. It's great to see so many friends from across the continent and beyond. Ambassador Josephine, uh, thank you and your team with DRR Sam and Kennedy for organizing this event to bring us all together. Um, firstly, I would like to congratulate uh, Tunji, PDG Dr. Tunji Funcho. So, so proud of him. No amount of words can suffice, be enough to give our profound gratitude to the African hero who is uh, really, uh, as Time magazine has said, the 100 most influential people in the world, so well deserved. 
Uh, he's brought pride to uh, Rotary. He's brought glory to Africa. Uh, he's a true African hero, and we honor him. We celebrate him for this wonderful leadership that he has provided to kick polio out of Africa and very soon out of our world. Uh, I also would like to uh, thank uh, PDG Aziz Memon, Trustee Aziz Memon, uh, and I wanted to assure him if he was with us that Africa is with him in this last stretch. As uh, um, uh, Mr. Mann said, we will get it done. We will be there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Zafran and uh, PDG Judith. Uh, so happy to have you amongst us. As uh, we were promised that we are having a real uh, treat with the experts. Uh, Dr. Josephine, we have really been given that treat. So thank you so very much. Uh, as trustee of the Rotary Foundation, I'd like to commend Rotarians from all over the world. You have been the true heroes, despite the challenges presented by the pandemic. Um, you have really, you know, been the real people of action, done our organization extremely proud. You have written grants and uh, you have gone out of your way to support our communities. Uh, you, you've written grants to the value of millions of dollars just in the last four months. When the world came to a total standstill, Rotarians were very, very busy serving their communities and um, trying to, you know, mitigate the effects of the pandemic. There is also, um, I'd like to say how interesting and uh, exciting time it is for us to be Rotarians in Africa. Our contribution to the Rotary Foundation continues to grow steadily. Rotarians know and believe in our foundation. They know that our foundation transforms lives in our communities. And you know that it's your contribution that saves lives. You know that it's your contribution that has saved so many children out of braces and um, crutches. Uh, and, and I'd want to thank you all. It is your contribution that has brought us to the cusp of uh, total polio irrigation from this globe. And you know that our work, as Dr. Tunji Puncho said, is not complete till we immunize the last child. So I urge you to continue participating and giving to the Rotary Foundation. So when uh, we work together as with our partners, we really win together every last child. We must get to it, that person. Again, this is the most exciting time for Rotarians of Africa. Of course, kicking polio out will be the highlight for a very long time. Rotarians, uh, you know, uh, with the help of our partners, we've achieved success where a lot of people had perceived that this was impossible. We're, we're there. Uh, just a small stretch to go and we will get there. Uh, another exciting part uh, is uh, the launch of the Peace Center at the Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. Our first peace program in Africa, providing an academic uh, program specifically designed for African students to solve the unique African challenges. We then had the amazing partnership agreement with Global Partnerships for Education, an initiative of the World Bank and Roach International with the Ministry of Education in Kenya uh, and soon in other countries to address um, the specific needs of basic education and literacy, perhaps in the most underserved uh, pastoralist community in Kenya, the Turkana, county of Turkana. Uh, friends, I can give you thousands more reasons why we're truly privileged to be Rotarians uh, of Africa in terms of membership growth, our impact, our service, our particip participation in uh, writing grants and contributing to the foundation. We really are doing great. But I must not take more of your time uh, because I know that that is not the reason why I was invited. I was specifically invited uh, uh, and really extremely honored and most privileged uh, to be introducing our keynote speaker, our own Vice President, uh, Jorita Solari. Our Vice President, Jorita, is a very dedicated Rotarian. She truly leads by example. Um, I first met Pres uh, Vice President Jorita in 2020, 2010, 2011, when she was part of the Burgundy Brigade. For the new Rotarians and Rotaractors amongst us, please take a moment uh, in your busy schedule to find out what this Burgundy Brigade is. I'll just give you a small hint. They were the people who were building communities and bridging continents. So next time we meet, you have to tell us what that was all about. 
Our Vice President Jorita is the board member and a visionary officer of Solari Enterprises, a property management company with over 300 members specializing in affordable housing. A business co-founder co -founded with her husband, Bruce, they both strongly believe in the ethos of Rotary and live by the guiding principles of Rotary. As a leader, she took the, her district to greatest heights by organizing the first million dollar dinner, at the same time, helping make her district 100% Paul Harris Fellows, an incredible achievement by any standard. Uh, Vice President Jorita has served on numerous leadership positions at Rotary International, and she and uh, her husband Bruce wholeheartedly support the Rotary Foundation as major donors and as members of the Arch Club Society. More than that, Jorita is my friend for so many years, and I'm so proud to say that. Rotary runs deep in the veins of both Bruce and our Vice President. I say this because their daughter, Gianna, will soon be district governor, making it the first time a mother-daughter will serve in these two leadership positions simultaneously. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so honored and privileged to present to you our Vice President, Jorita Solari. <laughs> oh, thank you, Gita. Uh, you're such a good friend, and thank you for the kind words. And I, I really, truly feel you're my sister. So I, I, I'm so glad that you were the one that, were in, that was able to introduce me. And I bring greetings, <clears throat> excuse me. I bring greetings from Rotary International President Holger Cannot and First Lady Susan. My dear family of Rotary and friends, I am honored, honored to be with you to celebrate Rotary and Polio Free Africa. I'm indeed humbled to join this esteemed and accomplished panel of experts and Rotary family. But tonight is about you, celebrating and recognizing all the good you're doing in the world to end polio. And I offer my sincerest congratulations for Africa being certified as polio free. This is truly an historic accomplishment. You know, it's good to be back in Africa again, this time celebrating Polio Free Africa, even though, yes, it's a, virtu a virtual visit. A few years ago, when polio threatened to reemerge in Africa, specifically in Nigeria, I watched the Rotary World and all of our partners come together to immediately stop this outbreak. As you recall, Nigeria had been polio free for almost three years when new cases were discovered. And I was honored to be part of the National Immunization Days that was quickly put together to respond to this outbreak. Thousands of Rotaractors, Rotarians, health workers, parents, and others spread across the country to immunize millions of children. Our NID teams spent their days in villages, communities, marketplaces, anywhere where children could be found. And then after the long days of immunizing children, Rotarians, representative from the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and local government officials came together at emergency operation centers every evening to, to come together to determine the best way to strategize and plan for the next day's campaign, all working together to protect the children from this insidious disease. It was a magnificent display of Rotary and their partners at their best and led to the success that we are all celebrating today. I can think of no other organization that could have responded so quickly and so effectively to this important issue. But as was said earlier, our work is not done. The World Health Organization, Rotary International, CDC, UNICEF, the Bill and, again, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Gavi are working together with others to fight the virus in Pakistan and Afghanistan. 
And in today's interconnected world, we must keep the population immunity levels high so that the wild polio virus does not come back to paralyze any child in the world. You know, these are significant and exciting times to be a member of our Rotary family. President Holger said, Rotary is not just a club you join, but an invitation to endless opportunities. Endless opportunities. We need leaders like you that will take advantage of the opportunities that have and will continue to present themselves as we live through and come out of this pandemic. We can take advantage of what we're learning now and reinvent how we do the business of Rotary. We don't have to go back to the old ways of doing business. We can come out of this different. This global pandemic, as terrible as it is, has given us an opportunity to adapt to new innovative changes. I encourage you to change your mindset, to think about the future, to think about how will Rotary do what we're doing in a different world? Because my friends, it will be different. The good news, all over the world, Rotarians are adapting the way we connect and serve. Rotarians are disrupting what the people think about Rotary. Clubs, districts, Rotary International Board of Directors and the foundations and Rotary staff are all living the strength of Rotary's action plan. We're increasing our ability to adapt, increasing our impact and enhancing participant engagement and expanding our reach. Globally, Rotary has shifted to virtual meetings. Clubs around the world are experiencing higher member attendance and access to some very high powered speakers like those you heard earlier. In fact, some of the Rotary Clubs are not only looking at how they can adapt now, but also in the future and be able to continue to both use the virtual platform and in-meet and in-person meetings as they move forward. And districts, districts are having Zoom series like this being live streamed on Facebook, reaching more Rotarians, Rotaracts, Rotaractors, and friends of Rotary than ever before. You have increased the impact in your communities, giving food to those who would go hungry and making and distributing face shields and masks, setting up hotlines to address questions related to the COVID-19 concerns, setting up hand washing stations, making sure the first responders in your communities had personal protective equipment and so much more. You know, Governor Patrick has set a membership goal to expand our reach to bring 1,500 new members into Rotary this year. And both of us are confident that you are all up to the tax to embrace the reach one, bring one strategy. And how easy is it to follow up with people that have already expressed an interest in joining Rotary? All you have to do is contact your district membership team because they have the potential new member contact information. And now, now is the time to engage Rotaract participation. Rotaractors and many non-Rotarians have stepped up to help with projects. Continue to bring rotor actors to the table as equals working together with you. This step will make it much easier for them to transition into a rotary club. We're engaging members like never before. The people of, rotor of the world are seeing what we're doing and want to be a part of this change. We are people of action looking to the future. We learn from our many experiences and evaluate the results of these experiences, learning from our setbacks and our successes. We create solutions that last, which is evident in our fight to end polio. Anyone who's taken part in Rotary knows that our organization is much more than a collection of clubs. Rotary 
is a force that puts us in touch with millions of others who share our belief in making the world a better place. It connects us with new ways to make difference and new networks of people with whom to make that difference. Friends, it will take strong leaders to be able to ride this giant wave of change, but we will come out of this to better, better and together. Our, our opportunities are magical. How will you open these doors? Let's seek out new ways to translate our expertise into making a difference in our communities and across the globe. Let's prove that our impact on the world has only just begun. Let's build connections and opportunities that will allow people who share our drive to do the same. Let's recommit to putting the needs and expectations and growth of our participants at the center of what we do. Let's stay true. Let's stay true to ourselves and stay ahead of change in the next 115 years. And as we come through this Rotary year, we might not see each other in person as much as we'd like. However, we still have opportunities to network, to think outside the box. You will continue to accomplish your projects and support your, community, your communities and help each other to look to our future and continue, continue to spread hope. Governor Patrick, your successes will be the club's successes as you work to stay connected with them during these times, to search out and implement opportunities. Know this, my friend, no challenge is insurmountable in Rotary, in our clubs. It's the challenges that make us who we are. Our service through Rotary makes us better per people. Our theme this year, Rotary Opens Opportunities is real and perfect for these times. Governor Patrick, it brings me great pride to be here with you and the members of my Rotary family and friends to celebrate Rotary and a polio-free Africa. In closing, I'd like to share with you the words our daughter said in her district governor induction earlier this year. Fill your heart with love, your mind with truth, and your life with service. My dear Rotary family and friends, I wish you all success and joy as you continue your Rotary journey. God bless you and thank you all. Thank you very, very much, Vice President Jorita. I will step in at this point. Governor Patrick has had to run to hospital to attend to an ill relative, but I am very sure that he wanted to let you know that your presence has indeed crowned our event with honor and also to thank you for the greetings from President Olga. Your thoughtfulness is reflected in the words adapting, disrupting business, virtual and blended platforms, but also the challenge to the district. And as you ended, asking us to recommit ourselves to stay ahead. We want to thank you so much for those words of wisdom. I'd like to ask all who are on our webinar to stay tuned. We have about 120 of you on Zoom and many more on Facebook listening in to this quality conversation. And now, in the words of the challenge of the Vice President, we're going to move to a different section in our program. We're moving to the breakout sessions where now we will ask you to sit with us and come out of those sessions with your recommitment to staying ahead. At this point, I'm delighted to turn over to the immediate past district rotary actor representative, DRR, Sam Karanja, who's going to lead us forward with a team of able rotary actors into the breakout sessions. There's nothing that you need to worry about during this phase. Our able rotary actors have it all worked out for us on the e-platform. Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Justin. Right now we are going to move into our breakout sessions. We have six 
topical issues or around polio eradication and shall be led by some of our expert speakers and we'll also have local Rotarians who have been at the forefront fighting polio and the whole session will be coordinated by some of our Rotaract leaders. So I'm going to launch the breakout sessions. We'll have about 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll all come back to the main plenary. Thank you. It's a visa, no, it's a visa card, please. Go ahead. 